Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> but to be back to do this talk about the Golden Dawn. And um, when I think about the Golden Dawn, I can uh, honestly say that when I first came across the Golden Dawn in a roundabout fashion was when I was about 15 years old. 15 years old. And this came about because many years ago, at my house, my family were great readers, but I wasn't. And my dad was an avid reader, and he was reading books all the time, and he used to always be carrying books around with him, and he used to urge me and my brother to read books, and we weren't interested. Anyhow, one particular summer, he decided he had to get me reading in one shape or another, so he said, right, come on, Brian, you're going to the library. He said, we're going to get you reading. He said, there's some books in there you'll enjoy. He said, right, okay, fine. So I went off to the library with him, and he says, come on, there's all these books, what do you fancy? I said, I have no idea. He says, come on, I'm determined to get you into reading. He said, right, we'll point you over to the W section. Because my dad was reading a series of books that he said was great books and he wanted to get me in it. And it was the Dennis Wheatley books. So he said, go and pick a book there. I'm sure that when you pick one, you'll enjoy it. I wasn't interested. I picked one that had a fancy cover on it. That's all. I just picked one out and thought, well, that looks interesting. And on the cover of this book was the Gort of Mendes. I'm sure that some of you might be familiar with that symbol. It was the Goat of Mendes. And I looked, I thought, well, this looks interesting. So I read the frontispiece piece on the book, and I thought, this sounds very interesting. I'll get this one. And this book was called The Devil Rides Out. And I'm sure that a lot of you here tonight will have read that book. It's a cracking book. And that converted me and got me into reading. And I never looked back after reading that book. And just for the ones who are not familiar with the story, it's basically about four goodies just there's the Duke Derrick Law, there's Rex Van Rins, Simon Aaron, and Richard Eaton. They're, those are the four goodies, and they are fighting the forces of evil. And the evil person in that book, if some of you remember, was a Mr. Moore Carter. He was the black magician that they had to defeat. I'm sure that if you've read the book, and if you haven't read the book, you want to buy it because it's a cracker. And I've got a copy of it for years. So that was the theme of the book. These four goodies are fighting the forces of evil, which is this Mr. Moore Carter, the black magician. After that, I read constantly the weekly books. My dad was right. I was converted. I moved on from there into reading magic books of all different shapes and sizes and about all different subjects. And eventually, I started to discover, I discovered various people who were into magic in this country. And I came across that familiar name, Alistair Crowley. So in other words, we had our very own magician here in England. So it was only a matter of time before I found some of his books. And then about 10 years after reading that Devil Rides Out book that got me into it, I came across that book that was written by John Simons, The Great Beast, all about Crowley's life. I studied that and I was fascinated by it all. And unfortunately, I let that book out and never got it back. I should never have done it. But now you can buy all these books because they're all available, Amazon, the rest of it. But it was a great book. And what I found when I read that book, the Great Beast, written by John Simons. In that book, Crowley is telling us that somewhere in the distant past, he was interviewed by Dennis Wheatley at a dinner because Dennis Wheatley was thinking of writing a new type of book. So he interviewed Crowley because Crowley was the black magician. And he gleaned all what he could and he decided to write a black magic story based on what Crowley had told him. And that book was the devil rides out. So in other words, all those years had passed, but the two books were linked. So he wrote The Devil Rides Out, and the model for Mr. Moore Carter, as I'm sure you know, was Alistair Crowley. Because when you read the Dennis Wheatley book, you start to see what information is passing. Because when you read The Great Beast about Crowley's life, you start to understand about the Golden Dawn, because he was a member, and he references the Golden Dawn all the time in that book. So once I'd read The Great Beast by Crowley, then it all came together and closed the loop for me because then the devil rides out I started to understand where Dennis Wheatley had got the symbols from. It was golden dawn stuff. So all the symbolism and the rituals and the magic that they were discussing was all golden dawn. So I thought even then, I put two and two together and we're talking about Golden Dawn. So obviously I started to get interested in the Golden Dawn and started to look at it, basically from them two books. The Devil Rides Out, all the other black magic stories that we wrote, and they're all available, and The Great Beast by John Simons about Crowley. And that was it, so I started and drifted onto the Golden Dawn. But when you start talking about doing a talk about the Golden Dawn, it soon becomes apparent that 
talks and subjects like the Golden Dawn are a lifetime subject. They're a lifetime study because they are so complex. And the Golden Dawn is a classic example of that. Once you start digging and delving into that, it is a lifetime study. And then when you're thinking about doing a talk about that subject, well, you always finish up, as I'm sure most speakers will, will, um, help, will, will agree with, you finish up with about five hours worth of material, and then you're trying to get it down and reduce it into some workable form to actually produce and give a presentation and a lecture. So you're always faced with that problem of what to keep in and what to take out to get it into a reducible form where you can actually give a lecture on it and summarise the subject. The beauty of the Golden Dawn is we are dealing with a cast of characters that will grace any stage and put in first-rate performances because these were some of the people, they were talented people, educated people, but some of them were the most bizarre, eccentric and wayward characters you could ever wish to meet. And these were like others before them wanted to discover secret wisdom, spiritual enlightenment, secret knowledge. And the path of the seeker is fraught with obstacles of one sort or another. And very few who have trod that path have discovered what some would call the holy grail of knowledge. And some people would say that knowledge was unattainable. But if you wanted to seek out secret knowledge, there are lots of ways of doing it. And I'm sure that whatever you read, the magic books or the mystical books, everybody's got their own idea of how to, to acquire this secret knowledge. But one of the ways was to join a magical order or a society of that nature like the Golden Dawn. So once you start looking at the Golden Dawn, people ask that question, how was it created, why was it created, and what was it all about? Well, let's, there's no getting away from it with the Golden Dawn. It's a very, very complicated and complex subject. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Golden Dawn in detail. It is very complex and a very, very complicated history. And the origins of the Golden Dawn are shrouded in mystery. Even to this day, shrouded in mystery. But it is generally thought that the Golden Dawn was started by one man. One particular man, way back. And that man was a London physician, he was a coroner and a Freemason. And that man was William Wynne Westcott. When a certain Mr. Kenneth Mackenzie, who was the Grand Secretary of a Rosicrucian Society in the South, suddenly died in 1886, William Wynne Westcott, the doctor and physician, was elected the new secretary to take over Mackenzie's job. So on being nominated to take over this grand secretary's job of this Rosicrucian society in the south, he received all the papers necessary to fulfill that task from Mackenzie's widow. I'm glad you pay attention. <laughs> because it's very key to follow this story, so I'm glad I've got a riveted audience here. You've got to follow it step by step because it's complex. And I hope you do, it'll be worth it at the end, I'm sure it will be. But he, Westcott got all the papers for the Grand Secretary's job of Mackenzie's widow. When he got those documents, he found, mixed in with these Grand Secretary documents, a set of papers written in cipher code, which will call for convenience the cipher manuscript. Written in cipher code, and Westcott found the key to translate these papers. And he found when he translated these papers, they were the rituals of an unknown occult order by the name of the Golden Dawn. Amongst these papers was a little slip of paper with an address on it. And that address was the name of a Rosicrucian adept who went by the name of Soro Sapiens Dominamiter Asteris. In other words, that's a magical name for this high-ranking woman whose name was Anna Sprengel. So, he had an address, he had some ritual papers of an unknown occult owner, the Golden Dawn. He was going to take the Grand Secretary's job of this Rosicrucian Society, he was all set. Because Westcott decided he'd been looking round for a society to, that he could run alone that was going to be open to both men and women. So he decided that he had a bit of a, a link here, he wanted to open up a new magical society. So he decided to write to this woman, Anna Sprengel, to see whether he could open up a temple here in London. So he wrote to Anna Sprengel in Germany, asking permission, and a few weeks later he got an answer back saying he was permitted to open up a temple in London. So in February 1888, William Wynne Westcott, having received permission, opened a temple in London and created the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Are you with me so far? Yeah. <laughs> 
To help him run it, he enlisted the services of two men. Another was a London physician and coroner by the name of Robert Woodman, William Robert Woodman. He was going to help him to run this new organisation, this new Golden Dawn. He enlisted the services as well of a third person, Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, to help him write up the rituals. These three men nominated themselves the three secret chiefs who would run this new Golden Dawn. It's time to turn this over now because, as many people will know when I do talks, I like to illustrate it with my own bits of drawings and sketches. I've always done it and it just keeps me handy in the drawing. I've drawn these three secret chiefs just so we can have an idea of what they look like. Because people told me who've seen pictures and studied this subject that they're reasonable likenesses. So these are the three people. Those are the three people. They signed the pledges in February 1888 and signed the charter in March 1888. Westcott was 40, Woodman was the older man at 60, and the Mathers was 33 years old. They elected themselves the three secret chiefs. They opened up a temple in London, and it was called the Isis Urania number three in the outer. The number one temple was over in Germany, that was the head office temple. Number two, temple was the Hermanibus temple, but that was abroad somewhere, but that was now defunct. So this one that opened up in London to start off the Golden Dawn here in England was the Isis Urania number three in the outer. <coughs> the thing about the Golden Dawn for me, the fascination about the Golden Dawn has always been part and parcel of the fascination for the Victorian age in general. I've studied the Victorian age because to me it was the time of handsome cabs, Sherlock Holmes, Oliver Twist, and the London slums. Because by the time that these three had opened up this and invented the Golden Dawn here in England, London in 1888 was just a massive slum in southern England. And 1888 was a key year, as I'm sure that some of you can always remember anyway and are tuning into what I'm going to be talking about. Because a few months on from these three creating the Golden Dawn, an event happened that stamped 1888 into the imagination and the consciousness of just about everyone. Because London, this festering sore in England, down in the south there, with all the poverty, stepping into that hellhole was Jack the Ripper. He stepped into this cauldron in August 1888, and fear and panic came with him. And the crimes that have been baffling They've been fascinating, but they still remain unsolved to this day, irrespective of the documentaries we might see on the television and the books that we might read, putting forward possible names and suspects. At the end of the day, it's an unsolved case. Five murders, the first in August, and the last one on November the 9th, 1888, when Mary Kelly was murdered, and then Jack the Ripper vanished into the night. But he didn't vanish from the imagination. He stayed in the consciousness about everyone. And we're still wondering today who Jack the Ripper was. So in other words, what did these three, Westcott, Woodman and Mathers, invent and create during the reign of Jack the Ripper? They created this hermetic order of the Golden Dawn. So what have they now created? They created a magical society that would offer its members a program of magical study based on the tree of life, in other words, the Kabbalah. In other words, in short, what, if you look in the records, they call it the magic of Hermes. Is everybody familiar with that term? The magic of Hermes? This is a very complicated subject and I've no intention of going into it tonight because it's a, a full talk all on its own. But in simplified fashion, the magic of Hermes, when you start to research that, is based on a mythical figure from the distant past. A real mythical figure, a composite figure that was a mixture of two gods. One was the Greek god Hermes and the other half was the Egyptian god Thoth. So in other words, Hermes, this patron of magic, is half and half, half Greek, half Egyptian god. And this mythical figure of Hermes was said to be a grandson of Adam. He was supposed to be the builder of the pyramids and he was supposed to be the patron of magic. And he supposedly wrote a massive volume, a multi-volume work called the Hermetica, which was all based on philosophy and religion, and if you will, it's like a Britannica encyclopedia, a massive work consisting of many, many volumes. And eventually this massive work found its way 
into the great library of Alexandria. In other words, Alexandria, that famous city of antiquity that was founded by Alexander the Great somewhere in the 330s BC. And it had one of the greatest libraries in the world, <coughs> the Library of Alexandria. Eventually, all this massive work on philosophy and religion found its way into this big library. And it stayed there until it was destroyed by the big fire that was caused by Julius Caesar's raid on Alexandria in uh, 48 BC. So the big famous library that housed many, many valuable works was destroyed in that fire caused by Julius Caesar. But rifling through the ashes, surviving fragments from this massive work was found. So various select people or followers of this creed got hold of the surviving fragments and buried them in a secret location in the desert. Only to be seen by worthy people who could read all this stuff and understand it. Along came from that what they called a group called the Neoplatonists, and these were a group of people, the Romans and Greeks, who followed Plato the philosopher's work. I'm sure some of us might have read Plato over the years. Plato, you can buy his books anywhere, very interesting stuff. If you read the Republic, a lot of his ideas are in that, but the followers of Plato believed in his theory of ideas. The theory of ideas was all about, basically, that the world of our experience is only a shadow of the pure and unchanging world that lies behind. In other words, we don't see that, we just experience a, a, just a, a form of it. So these were followers of that theory, and I've read that theory in detail years ago when I studied philosophy. So what the Neoplatonists did was try to write an all-embracing synthesis that embraced the philosophy, the religion, the uh, magic of Hermes, and they broad termed it as Hermetics. And all this involved magic, the Kabbalah, and you name it, everything was linked in this massive work that all goes under the heading of Hermetica. In other words, the magic of the Western mystery tradition that people follow to this day. And that's what the Golden Dawn proposed to pass to its members. I know it sounds complicated, but it is when you start to read it, but it's basically the Kabbalah, the mysticism, religion, and magic in all its forms. And that was going to be the basis of study. So that's what these members who would join the Golden Dawn was going to receive. Every member who joined would be initiated into the Golden Dawn. They would all have a Latin motto. And all initiations were going to be done at the headquarters that was in London, in Great Queen Street, at Mark Mason's Court. That was the headquarters of this London temple. Not there now, long demolished. Other things have been built on it. And the first person to be enrolled and initiated into the Golden Dawn was a young woman. In another part of London, in 1888, the Slay School of Art. I'm sure we've all heard of the Slay School of Art, still going to this day. There was two young students in that Slay School of Art, two young women. One was a young 22-year-old woman called Mina Bergson, and the other was a young woman called Annie Horniman. She was about 28. She was the daughter of Frederick Horniman, in other words, of the Horniman's Tea Empire. Do we all remember Horniman's Tea? Of the 50s, I remember it well because my mother always bought Horniman's tea. I don't think you can get it now, but she always bought Horniman's tea because, in other words, it was probably like Thai food. So Annie Horniman, in other words, was a wealthy woman because she was in she was part of this Horniman's tea empire. These two were young students of art at the Slay School of Art. Annie Horniman recognised that this young Minor Bergson was a brilliant artist, a brilliant artist, and that she was better than her. So she made Minor Bergson an amazing proposal. She offered to let Minor Bergson go to Paris to study art and that Annie Horniman would fund it with her money. Now that was an amazing offer which Minor Bergson was thinking of taking up. But just before she decided to do that, she met Mathers, one of the secret chiefs of this new Golden Dawn, and Mathers persuaded her to join the Golden Dawn. So Minor Bergson joined the Golden Dawn to be the first initiate into the Golden Dawn in 1888. The second initiate, or very early on in the Golden Dawn's organisation, was the wife of Oscar Wilde. She joined Constance Mary Wilde.